This is uh, the eighth, uh, eighth class in our new members class, and um, this, this morning we plan on covering um, listening to God's Word. Uh, I thought it would be important, especially since so much of what we do, um, and I'm going to argue that that's the proper thing to do, uh, is centered around the Word of God. And, uh, and so I thought it'd be helpful for us to think through uh, just some of the basics of the importance of listening to the Word of God. So let me start with a word of prayer, and then we'll get rolling. Lord God Almighty, we come before you and ask for your help as we seek to open up your Word and see the importance of the Word in the gathering, and that you would give us ears to hear what your Word says about the Word. Lord, we believe that the Bible is your voice to us. This is how you speak to us. That while this is an ancient book, thousands of years old, uh, it speaks to us with contemporary relevance and timeless truth. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. One of my, I'm not a real big fan of church art. Um, to be quite honest with you, <laughs> I get a little bit nervous when I see pictures of Jesus. Um, but one of my favorite uh, pieces of pieces of art that comes out of the Protestant Reformation, especially you know the the reformers, they they definitely didn't like church art. They like to you know tear it up and blow it up and stuff like that. But uh, amongst the Lutheran branch of the Protestants. Uh, they were a little bit more um, attracted to art. And uh, one of my favorite pictures that comes out of that period is a, is a painting. Um, I think it's a painting. It might be a woodcut. I'm not certain. Of uh, the preacher. And then there's the congregation. And as the preacher is preaching, Jesus is suspended over the congregation. And uh, it, it's a powerful picture of Jesus speaking by His Spirit through the preached Word. Um, and, and that is an emphasis of Lutheran theology, and I think an important emphasis in the Protestant Reformation. In fact, if you look at um, church architecture, um, it's, a, it's an important distinctive uh, that you often see in Roman Catholic church you'll see at the center in the front what do you typically see the altar right because of the sacrifice of the mass um and 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 all the belief that's that's accompanied there um but then typically and then you'll see off you know on the side you know somewhere uh in fact I, i've been in you know catholic churches usually for funeral services and you know sometimes somebody starts speaking and you're like w where are they at you know <laughs> and then you you know you look over and the binoculars off in the corner and the person's speaking you know from a podium in the corner well that's very intentional so the word of god is off to the side and the the uh the the communion and and all that's believed with the sacrifice of the mass is right in the center uh, well, that changes when typically when you go to a Protestant church, uh, the structure where you have the pulpit in the center, okay? Uh, and that's very intentional that uh, the center is, is the Word of God. And so uh, my first point here is the priority of the preached Word. Uh, you know, sometimes, you know, some churches may focus on experience or, you know, uh, you know what, what they'll call, you know, being a spirit-led church, um, others a, a Bible-saturated church. But I'm arguing that, that, that it's, it's not a matter of preference. Like, I like vanilla-flavored ice cream. You like chocolate. I like, um, you know, <laughs> cookie dough ice cream. You know, that, that I'm convinced when we look at the Bible itself, that New Testament churches trying to base themselves on, uh, on the New Testament are going to be Bible-focused churches. Um, not, not to the neglect of the Spirit, but believing that the Spirit of God works through His Word. Okay, 
And so turn to 2 Timothy chapter, uh, let's turn to 2 Timothy 3, a, a familiar verse at the end of 2 Timothy 3. 3, 16 and 17. This is Paul giving instructions to Timothy. Never was good at sword drills. Second Timothy chapter 3. See there, I'm in 1 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 16, familiar verse. All Scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So this is a a very important verse, familiar verse, that, that the Scripture, the writings are breathed out by God. They're inspired by God and therefore profitable uh, that they equip the man of God for some good works. No, for every good work. Okay, and then you also have to understand the chapter breaks um, are, are not part of the inspired word of God. They're, they're you know, a guy named Stephanus was the one who came up with the chapter breaks, uh, at least in the New Testament. And, and so, Verse 1 of chapter 4 uh, ought not to be disconnected from what we see at the end of chapter 3 where Paul says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God. So this is Paul writing to Timothy, a leader in the church. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who is judge of the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time is coming when they will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires. So notice Paul is giving instruction to Timothy on ordering the church on how to organize, order the church. And here, in, at the end of ter- 3, in the beginning of 4, there's this most solemn charge to Timothy as a church leader to give himself to preach the Word of God. Okay, And, and notice, when is he supposed to preach the Word? In season and out of season, which is to say, when it's convenient, and when it's not convenient, okay? Um, Listen to what John Calvin, the French reformer, says, Nevertheless, because he does not dwell among us, talking about God, God does not dwell among us in visible presence, we have said that he uses the ministry of men to declare openly his will to us by mouth as a sort of delegated word not by transferring to them his right and honor, but only through their mouths he may do his work just as a workman uses a tool to do his work. For among the many excellent gifts which God has adorned the human race, it is a singular privilege that he designs to consecrate to himself the mouths and tongues of men in order that his voice may resound in them. So that God is pleased to use the mouths of men as they open up the word of God as an instrument in his hand. Okay? Turn to one other passage, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Not just one other passage, there will be multiple passages to turn to. But I, I want you to understand this clearly. 1 Timothy 3 and... Uh, 1 Timothy especially, he tells us in 3, 14 and 15, he, he wasn't able to come to them, but he's writing these things so, they, so that they would know how they ought to conduct themselves in the household of God, 
which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So 1 Timothy is written on how the church is to be ordered in Ephesus, that where, where Timothy was. And in chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, Paul says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture and to exhortation and to teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance by the laying out of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that, you, so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do, do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. So again, Paul says, give attention to the reading of Scripture, to the teaching, to the exhortation, that this is to be a, a, a priority within the local gathering of God's people, okay? We see this also arise in, in the book of Acts. You remember there was a situation where um, there was evidently racism in the early church, okay? And remember, it was the Grecian widows who were being overlooked in the distribution of food, okay? And so... It's brought to the attention of the apostles that uh, because some of these uh, widows are of a different ethnic background, they're being overlooked. And so what do the apostles do? They delegate it, okay? They delegate it. They delegate it. They wind up appointing seven men to look over the matter and to make sure that this is dealt with but they say, we must give ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So this is, a, you know, it's an important matter. Uh, there was widows who needed to be fed. Uh, there was an issue that needed to be dealt with. But evidently the priority of the word of God was so important that, that the apostles who were functioning like elders in that early church in Jerusalem said, this is important, but... This is a matter we need to appoint some people to look after because if we, if we get elbow deep in this, then we might be neglecting something that's actually more important, namely the ministry of the word and prayer. Okay, So we can look at a hundred other verses on this uh, of the importance of the word of God and the gathering of God's people. Um, but, but I want you to understand that this is our commitment here. And, uh, and, and, and because we place a priority on it, um, I thought it would be helpful to spend some time giving instruction on how to be a good listener to the Word of God. And so that's my second point, not only the priority of the preached Word, but also the priority of actively listening to the preached Word. Um, notice I, I've tried to choose my words wisely, active listening. And, and there's a difference between passive listening and active listening. Um, and so under that head is to diligently pray for preacher and hearer alike. Second uh, Thessalonians 3.1 Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord will spread rapidly and be glorified just as it did also with you. So Paul tells the Thessalonians, pray for the word to run, to spread rapidly. Psalm 119, 18, open my eyes, the psalmist says, open my eyes that I might behold wonderful things from your law. And so it's important, part of preparation is to pray, pray for the word of God to do, uh, to do that work in our hearts. Any questions before we move forward? Comments? Okay, secondly, and this is where we'll spend the rest of our time, James 1, 20, uh, 1 uh, and following, 21 and following. Listen with clean ears. Uh, turn to James chapter 1. James is after the book of Hebrews. Before 1 Peter, there we are. 
James chapter 1. You know what, let me, let me back up and start in verse 19. He says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Now, that's often a verse we memorize in the context of personal relationships, right? You know, stop flapping your yapper, um, <laughs> start listening. Uh, the problem, now, now that's true, and there's other verses in the Bible that teach that, right? You know, you, the Proverbs, tons of Proverbs on the importance of listening and, you know, and having control over your speech. Um, but I think within this context, I, I think you'll see this is more in relationship to the Word of God. Uh, being quick to listen to the Word of God, slow to speak the Word of God, okay? Verse 21, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all the remains of wickedness in humility, receive the Word implanted, which is able to save your souls. Prove yourselves to be doers of the Word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. For anyone for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in the mirror. For immediately, for once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But the one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. And so let's focus our attention on verse 21. I'm calling this listening with clean ears. And so this is more kind of preparation for the word. Um, just in the same way, uh, if you were going to eat, you know, there's certain minimal, at least, preparations that you make. You know, set the table. You know, the food needs to be prepared. Um, you know, if you're in my house, you know, Go wash your filthy hands <laughs> before you sit down at the table. Uh, there's certain preparations that need to be made. Okay, In verse 21, he says, Putting aside all filthiness and all the remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted which is able to save your soul. Notice, first of all, it starts out with a therefore. And you know the old adage, Anytime there's a therefore, you ask what it's there for, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so, again, notice that connects us with verses 19 and 20. That's one of the reasons why I think that uh, 19 and 20 is not about listening in the context of relationship, but listening in the context of the Word of God. And also, a further argument for that is, notice in verse 18, it's also talking about the Word of God, namely how God uses the word to make new creatures. So verse 18 is about the word of God. Verse 21 is about the word of God. This whole section is about the word of God. It makes sense that verse 19 and 20 would be about listening, not in the context of personal relationships, but listening in the context of the word of God. Okay. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and remains of wickedness. Um, so what John is saying, or John, James, we've been in the book of John for a while, <laughs> sometimes it slips out. James, uh, which by the way is Jacob, Yakub. I don't know why the English translators have it as James, but anyways, that's another s subject for another day. Um, James says we are to put aside all filthiness and remains of wickedness. So this is the idea of putting off sin, Okay. Um, I've never had this happen, but I've heard periodically hear of people who all of a sudden experience hearing loss. And uh, maybe they'll go to an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and he looks in their ears, and pretty soon he brings out an irrigation kit and um, you know pulls this <laughs> huge hunk of wax from their ear. Yes, I know, it's disgusting. Uh, and, and I've heard, it's amazing, like immediately, like they can hear so clearly, okay? And then usually after that, there's some instruction 
uh, or questions that are asked, do you use a Q-tip for your, to clean out your ears? And usually the answer is yes. And then they're instructed, don't do that. Because when you are thinking you're cleaning your ears, you're actually just packing that wax deeper down in your ear. <laughs> and uh, um, point being is that you need to clean out your ears to be able to hear clearly, okay? And usually that's done most properly with some kind of irrigation, not through the, uh, you know, the Q-tip. The Q-tip usually is just packing that down. Well, in a similar way, if we're stuffing our face on sin, then we're not going to have much of an appetite for the Word of God, okay? Um, in fact, uh, First Peter says something similar in, in First Peter uh, it's just one book over. It's probably worth turning to. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 and 2. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word so that you may grow in respect to salvation. So Peter, Peter's saying almost the exact same thing here. In other words, put aside sin be confessing your sin and turning away from it and then it's connected with verse 2 like a newborn baby you know you you see babies uh they're hungry right <laughs> you know and they're not afraid to let you know they're hungry okay um and we want to crave the milk of the word like that so that we would grow but again if we're stuffing our face upon the junk food of sin, then we're not going to have much of an appetite for the Word of God. I think also there's some uh, other practical things we can think about in this regard. Um, to, to be committed to, to being here. Um, I know that sounds basic. I mean, you're all here, right? <laughs> uh, but, but making it a priority that, that this is an event. This is an important event. This is, you know, uh, something that I don't want to neglect in my life to gather with God's people to come under the hearing of God's word. Um, David Ebby in his helpful book, I think it's called Power Preaching for Church Growth, which sounds like a goofy title, but it's a really good book. Uh, he says, the common, he speaks of the common frustration for pastors. You grieve over flaky folks who don't take preaching very seriously, who miss services with seemingly no conscience, conscience pains and almost any, uh, at almost any flimsy, flimsy excuse. You mourn for a generation of red-eyed from Nintendo and TV, bloated with soccer, scouts, hot tubs, and designer vacations, but bored with the Word of God. So we don't, we don't want to be like that. Um, very practically, you know, I, I, I recommend, you know, we don't want to be legalistic in this regard, but, you know, it's, you know, think about your Saturday evenings and how you spend your Saturday evening. You, you know, if you're up late, you know, so that you come on Sunday morning and, you know, you're, you're in the land of Nod, you know, you're doing the, the head bob thing, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, aim to prepare, you know, so that you get a good night's sleep. Now, I'll, I'll give you a special dispensation of grace this morning because I know you lost an hour of sleep, <laughs> uh, but you know, but 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 aim to prepare. Um, you know, think about um, you know something that we try to do. We don't do it every week, but you know, as a family, to to read the passage that that we're going to be going over on Sunday together as a family, just kind of wetting our appetite for what's coming the next morning. Um, you know, aim to get here uh, promptly. Uh, in other words, um, you know, again, part of that is preparation. You know, um, 
you know, if you think about, you know, if you had a doctor's appointment or, you know, if you had classes, you know, um, you know, you want to make sure you get there on time um, so that you're not scurrying, you know, trying to find a seat and, you know, barking at the kids <laughs> and all that's involved. Yes, I am a father of five children. I, I know the difficulty of of herding cats, you know, to try to get get everybody here. But again, sometimes, you know, that means, okay, if you're looking at it, and we're always, you know, you know, uh, um, scurrying to get here on time, then, well, then maybe you just need to, you know, get up a little bit earlier so it's not as much of a rush or prepare things, setting your clothes out ahead of time the night before. Again, there, you know, you're not going to find a verse for that in the Bible, you know, put out your clothes on Saturday, you know. But again, when you, when you make something a priority, then you're going to think through some of these things, okay? Um, George Swinnick says, I'm going to hear the word which has God for its author, Jesus Christ for its matter, eternal life for its end. Shall I like a beastly swine, <laughs> sorry, shall I like a beastly swine trample these valuable jewels under my feet? Shall that which is infinitely more precious than fine gold be esteemed to me as dirt? Uh, you get his point, you know. If we, if we really believe we're coming to hear the word of the living God, there, there's going to be something special about it that we, we take the matter seriously, Okay. Any questions, comments on that? Okay. And again, I you know, part of um, how can I put this tactfully? Um, you know, I have benefited from listening, you know, to sermons digitally. I mean, we live in an age, you know, of like. If you, you know, if your church or ministry like still like charges money for sermons and stuff, like something's wrong, right? You know, um, you know. I mean, so many of these different ministries have opened the vault, so you have access to thousands of sermons, teachings, lectures. I mean, you know, you know, you know. This is called the, you know, the information age. You know, the, if 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 you want to listen to good teaching, you can. So. You know, I often, I've said this before, I find myself, you know, I'm cleaning the garage, listen to, you know, lectures on apologetics or listen to a sermon series on Romans, you know, and, and, and that's good and helpful, but, but we also, sometimes then that can almost trivialize the, the event of listening to the Word of God. And so we need to be on guard that, you know, that, that the way in which we use that medium doesn't spill over into how we are always listening to the Word of God. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, number two, listen with attentive ears. And, and this takes us back to James 1, 19 and 20. This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone is to be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, for the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Focusing in on quick to hear, quick to hear. This is the first of three commands. And uh, as I mentioned already, this is, I believe, talking about being quick to hear uh, the word of God. Um, Edmund Hebert says, while the counsels of James are valuable in human relations, the primary reference is probably to hearing in the context of worship. James is commanding them to be quick to listen, to be ready to listen, to be a good listener to the Word of God. This makes me think of a uh, Doberman Pinscher, you know, that breed of dogs um, you know, <laughs> with their ears pointy up in the air. You know, when their owner calls them, you know, it's like they're listening, right? <laughs> You know, their ears seem like little antennas, you know, that immediately can, can hear the, the frequency of, uh, of their owner's voice. Um, you know, that's one of those things that I wish 
my children had those kinds of ears for their parents, you know. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll give a directive and, you know, Dad, I didn't hear you. Your job is to hear me, okay? That's what you're responsible. You're responsible to have out of the many voices that exist in this world. When you hear my voice, you perk your ears up. Yes, Dad. I wish it worked out that way, but it's a work in progress. Uh, the word to attend, um, it comes from Latin attendere, literally means to stretch. And, you know, and that's, that's kind of the idea, you know, when, when you're, you're stretching out. Or, or sometimes, um, like Proverbs, uh, Proverbs 2, 1 through 6, my son... Uh, Hear my son, incline your ear. Uh, you know, it's like the idea of, you know, bending your ear to listen to somebody. Sometimes you see that if somebody, you know, has uh, some hearing loss, you know, uh, you know, speak into my good ear, you know. You could just kind of see them stretching, uh, you know, um, because they want to hear what's being said. Well, that should be the the posture of our hearts. Charles Spurgeon said, it is easier to hit a moving target than it is to get a distracted listener to hear the word of God preached. Um, and again, you know, the context in which we live, you know, and, and I get it, you know, I got iPhones, iPads, there's beeps, buzzes, vibra, I got an iWatch, you know. In fact, we might have been here a couple Sundays ago where Siri starts talking back to me in the middle of a sermon, you know, like, I mean, I get like, so we got all these devices and we're, you know, accessible at any moment to anybody. Um, and so, you know, it's made us all ADHD, right? You know, we're all like, mm -hmm, you know, oh, that's my phone, you know, um, and it's hard to stay focused, you know. And so, you know, sometimes we just got to unplug, you know, shut the devices off. But, but especially, you know, in the context of coming to hear the voice of God, we need to work hard uh, to, to make ourselves undistracted. And I understand, you know, um, you know, you know, maybe you, uh, you know, use the Bible on your phone. Um, you know, maybe just need to put it on airplane mode you know, when you come to church, um, or, you know, or, or maybe just, you know, do what I've done, you know, for a couple of years, I was using um, primarily for scripture reading a digital Bible, and I went back to a paper Bible, because I realized I was forgetting where things were at in the Bible, like, there's something about, like, visual memory, like, okay, I remember that verse is in the book of James, it's on the right hand column, you know, north, <laughs> and, but in a digital Bible, you don't got that, you know, I, I, I was feeling like I lost my salvation, you know, it was like, uh, you know, what happened to me here, I can't find verses anymore, and so I just went back to a paper Bible, now I still, I have a small fortune invested in Bible software, I still use that stuff, again, I'm not demonizing it, it's, it's a useful tool, but we also need to understand sometimes some of the unintended consequences of, uh, you know, of the innovations that we have and experience and benefit from. Um, again, sometimes this means, you know, we got, you know, we have a lot of children uh, in our midst. And, you know, and that's a good thing. But it, you know, as a father of five, it's a training work in process, you know. And so children can tend to be distracting, you know, they're turning around, you know, waving at their friends, you know, doing different things. And so, you know, sometimes if, 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 if you find that uh, you're not able to overcome that distraction, you might just need to move up a little bit further, move a couple rows up so you don't have, you know, children in front of you. And, you know, and again, I understand, you know, try to be patient with parents who are, are trying to train their children to listen in. And, and we've intentionally, you know, I understand most churches, um, you know, have, you know, children ages, you know, whatever, uh, seven and under, ten and under, you know, 
probably now it's like 22 and under, you know, after the music, you know, we're going to shuffle them off to another room and, you know, be, uh, because there's such a distract. Well, you know, I want, I want young people to learn to listen to the Word of God. I believe it's important for them to be here. Um, you know, so we, you know, we've tried to push that age as far as we can down, um, you know, and, you know, so we try to encourage, we don't make it a law of the Medes and Persians, but, you know, once the child hits age five, you know, time to start, you know, trying to train them to sit and listen. Um, and, uh, and so I get, you know, with that good thing, training a child to sit and listen, there can be sometimes difficulty and being easily distracted. And so, you know, encourage you to, you know, if that's a, an issue, you know, again, just try to move up. I understand not everybody can sit in the front row. There's only so many seats in the front row. But, you know, it also tends to be the row that, you know, is least likely to be occupied. I don't know if it's because I'm, you know, spitting when I'm up here and you don't want to get showered with, with, with uh, my respiratory droplets Um, what else? You know, sometimes, sometimes taking notes can be helpful. Um, you know, be careful that that's not also a distraction as well. You know, you, you want to listen to the Word of God. Um, sometimes also considering, I, I've noticed this with my own children, uh, you know, if they're, if they're being fed a large diet of entertainment, then they're more easily distracted. You know, I mean, it's just bottom line, it's hard to compete with, you know, cartoons and video games and stuff like that. You know, it's hard to get them to sit down and read, you know, if they're being fed a diet of, you know, uh, of entertainment. And so same thing with us. If You know, we may need to, you know, cut out, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, TV time or screen time to help us to train ourselves to be better listeners to the Word of God. And I get, I mean, th we are an anomaly, you know, like you guys sit there for 60 minutes on a Sunday morning, like you are a rare breed, you know, to listen to a monologue for, you know, 50 to 60 minutes, um, you know, but, but you know, and, and you know, I trust why that's many of you, wh the reason why many of you are here. You know, you want to hear the Word of God. Um, and, and so, in many ways, I, I get that I'm speaking to the choir. Um, and again, you know, think of the parable of the soils. The parable of the soils, who was it that's coming to snatch the seed of the Word of God from people's hearts? Satan, right? So, it's, we're talking about it's spiritual warfare, to hear the word of God, you know, and so we need to take it, you know, seriously that this is, this is a big deal. Satan does not want me to hear the voice of God as it comes through the scriptures. And so I need to fight that distraction. I need to fight that temptation. Questions, comments up to this point. Okay, number three, listen with reverent ears. Notice he says to be slow to speak. And again, I think the idea here is to be slow to speak the Word of God. Um, the Word of God, it's God's Word. You know, I have a solemn responsibility of telling you what God has said. It's solemn because I don't want to get it wrong, right? Like, have you ever had somebody, uh, you know, say you said something and you didn't say it? You know, you don't like that, right? Well, I'm pretty sure God doesn't like that as well. He doesn't like people going around saying that he said stuff that he didn't say. Okay? He doesn't like people putting words in his mouth. He doesn't like people uh, deleting things that he did say. Okay? And so it's a very solemn responsibility that I have. And, you know, again, remember James says in James chapter 3, in the context of, you know, James 3, you think of James 3, that's, that, you know, that's the tongue chapter, right? Well, in the beginning, within that context, he says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such you will incur a stricter judgment. 
James, in the context, he's talking about self-control over the tongue, and within that context, he's talking about the solemnity of being a teacher of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, Paul says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. He says, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in trembling when he preached. He was afraid to preach. It's a dangerous business. And, and so that communicates to me that, again, this is the Word of God. Um, this is a serious matter. Thomas Watson said, do we prize it, speaking of the word of God, in our judgments? Do we receive it into our hearts? Do we fear the loss of the word preached more than the loss of peace and trade? Again, do we attend to the word with reverential devotion? When the judge is giving the charge on the bench, all attend. When the word is preached, the great God is giving us his charge. Do we listen to it as a matter of life and death? So, we need to clean out our ears. We need to listen with earnestness. Listen with reverence. Listen with humble ears. Notice he says in verse 19, 20 again, to be, or verse 19, to be slow to speak and to be slow to anger. It might seem odd. Who gets angry when he's listening to the Bible or she's listening to the Bible? I mean, you may sit there and say, well, I like the Bible. Well, sometimes the Bible gets up in your grill. <laughs> sometimes the Bible meddles in your life. Sometimes the Bible, you know, makes us uncomfortable, okay? I mean, you know, we read, I mean, we could read a passage today where it talks about God hardening people's hearts. I mean, you know, that makes you uncomfortable. What do you mean God hardens people's hearts? Uh, you know, or, or, you know, you look at passages where God just kills people, you know? Um, not willy-nilly, but, you know, when they're doing stuff they're not supposed to be doing, God kills people. Yeah, it makes us uncomfortable when you think, well, I should be dead. Um, its natural co course is to crush us before it cures us to hurt us before it heals us. And so there can be a temptation to respond with anger, okay? You know, sometimes the Bible challenges our, our beliefs. It challenges our presuppositions. It challenges our traditions. Um, it makes us uncomfortable, you know, sometimes we find ourselves in, in the position of thinking, you know, wasn't well, there a verse in the Bible for that? And there's no verse there. <laughs> and, and, and we kind of become exposed that, uh, I thought that was in the Bible, it's not there. And so we, you know, anger is almost always related to pride, unless it's righteous anger. Unless it's concerned about God's glory, sinful anger is always concerned uh, about our glory, okay? And so, the humble response say, okay, God, this is your word, okay? I, I, I thought I have this belief over here, but maybe, maybe I'm incorrect if this is what your word is saying. Or I've been living this way, and now I'm realizing this is not right, I need to be humble and receive what you say. And this way he says in verse 21, more explicitly, in humility, receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. In humility, a humble heart that's quick to hear God's word. Isaiah 66, 2. This is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. God looks for people, dare I say, delights 
in the heart that hears his word with humility, contriteness, quick to see your sin, quick to see the error of your way, and a trembling heart at his word. Questions, comments on that? Okay, number five, listening with believing ears. Verse 21, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and remains of wickedness in humility, notice this language here, receive the word implanted. That, that's how I understand faith or believing is, is, a, is, is that open hand that receives what God has said. Receive the word implanted which is able to save your souls. To receive the word is to welcome the word. You know, to take it in. To believe what God has said. To seek to submit your heart, your life, your beliefs to what God has said in his word. Uh, this was the problem with the Israelites uh, in, in the wilderness wandering. And you read book of Exodus, Deuteronomy. Hebrews chapter 2 explains this. For indeed, we have the good news preached to us just as they also, talking about the Israelites in the desert, but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So the Israelites heard the word of God. They actually saw the miracles, but there was no benefit. Why? It wasn't united with faith. They didn't believe it. And then notice he says, to receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. God's word through the gospel, through the message of Christ delivers us from the power of sin from the penalty of sin, and ultimately from the presence of sin in eternal glory. Second Corinthians 2, 15, 16 says, For we are a fragrance of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one an aroma of death to death to the other an aroma of life to life. And who is adequate for these things? Paul describes the ministry of the preached word as it's an aroma. For some, and it's aroma of life to life. For others, it's an aroma of death to death. You know what, Tom, do you mind opening the door for Becky back there? <laughs> the point is, is that the Word of God either has a hardening effect or a softening effect. It's either the instrument of our salvation because we believe it or the instrument of our damnation because we don't believe it. John Piper in his book, The Supremacy of God in Preaching, says you wake up Sunday morning and you can smell the smoke of hell on one side and feel the crisp breeze of heaven on the other. You go to your study and you look down at your pitiful manuscript and you kneel down and cry, God, this is so weak. Who do I think I am? What audacity to think that in three hours my words will be the odor of of death to death and the fragrance of life to life. My God, who is sufficient for these things? It's a sobering reality of, of the Word of God. But it must be received with believing ears. Any questions, comments? Yes. Hey, was, uh, my name is Mm -hmm. Sure. I thought about tonight you said basically like uh, 
eating with dirty hands doesn't defy you as a man, something like that. But what comes out of your mouth comes from the heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, James 1, 2, 7, uh, I think it's like something about like uh, what pure is, like pure religion is. So thank you. Uh, Sure, yeah, thank you for that comment, Shane. Um, yeah, Jesus in, in, John, in Mark chapter 7 you know, says it's, it's not what goes into a man that defiles the man, uh, but what comes out, and it describes that, that sin ultimately originates from the heart. And, uh, you know, and that's part of the reason why it's, it's important for us to, you know, um, confess our sin, you know, um, in preparation to come and hear the word of God, to declutter our hearts, you know, from distractions, potential distractions. Um, now, obviously, we can't, you know, some things we can't account for, um, but as much as we can to, to, to come um, zoned in, focused, ready to hear the word of God. Good. Any other comments, questions? Hopefully it was helpful, just, you know, again, you know, we had some teachings on baptism, the Lord's Supper, church government, um, different things, you know, church-related things, and you know, so much of what we do here um, is focus upon the Word of God that I thought it would be important to have, you know, a specific teaching on how to listen to the Word of God. Um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, I encourage you to, you know, maybe even just tuck these notes away in your Bible and, you know, and, and look through it, you know, before Sundays, um, you know, just as a way of preparation. What does God say about how I can prepare to listen to the word of God? Um, and it would be a, a useful exercise so that you would profit the most um, out of the word of God. Anything else? All right, let me pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you and praise you for the reality that you are the God who speaks. And Lord, um, give us ears to hear. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. We need hearing ears and seeing eyes. Grant them to us, O oh Lord. Help us also to be good stewards of the ministry of the word, that we would come prepared, ready to hear the word of God. That you would help me as, uh, as a shepherd to prepare well to feed your people. that we might behold the glory of Christ as in a mirror and be transformed into the same glory from one degree of glory to another. And we know that this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, you get two minutes.